Hello and welcome to the Local Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Johnson. The Local Leaders Podcast provides a platform for successful business owners to share their stories, their experiences, their advice, and their ideas in order to help our listeners achieve more success in their business and in their lives. Get ready. Another great show is coming up. Hey, good morning and welcome to the Local Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Johnson, and I am thrilled and excited today to to be talking with some Austin, Texas legend, uh, Craig Blackus. And Craig, uh, you're smiling about that, so maybe legend is the wrong word, but uh, I don't know. The, the, The food looks really good. Well, thank you very much for having us today. We appreciate it. Well, you're, you're very welcome. And, uh, and Craig O's is, is uh, Craig's business. He's got four locations. I believe three are in Austin and one is in Lakeway. That is correct. And uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to, to go visit Craig O's yet, make sure that you do because uh, they have got some awesome, awesome food uh, and experience there. There's just a waiting for you. So, Craig, I want to open the door up for you and just give you the opportunity to kind of tell us a little bit about the business and how you got started and um, kind of where you are today. Got it. Well, thank you very much. Um, we hit a little milestone this past summer celebrating 18 years in Austin. Um, wow. Moved my family to Santa Barbara back in 2002. Uh, we opened up our first store in 2003 uh, in June. Um, and we were able to open up a few more locations after that. Um, and the big, best thing about, you know, to me, what we do is we're very community centered. Um, my first job was with CC's Pizza back in the 90s. I uh, worked for that company for eight years in its infancy until it's grown to 500 plus stores. And the owner constantly beat us into a set. You know, we have to be deep rooted in our communities if we're going to be successful. And we were able uh, to take that model and bring it to Craigos here in Austin. And if you go by any of our stores, you'll see that we're very you know, in bed with our churches, our schools, our community centers, YMCA's, whichever that local sports. Um, and that was a really big, um, not that it was a big decision, but it was, it's a big part of who we are and, and how we operate. Um, we do a lot of community fundraisers for whether it's food drives for our local company here called Hungry Souls. We've done benefits for <clears throat> high school students who've been seriously injured in car accidents. We've done you know, free pizza giveaways to nonprofits that needed to feed some people in our communities. So um, it's really important for us to, to be part of where we serve. And every owner takes that, obli- you know, takes that as a serious obligation. Right. Uh, and it's, it's been a great ride. I mean, we have four stores, you know, we were able to pivot during the last 18 months during this pandemic. And we really saw the community in, in return support us, um, you know, especially when the doors had to close and they couldn't dine in. You know, we went from basically 90% delivery and takeout, obviously, to 100. And, you know, people, you know, we started selling eggs and rice and beans and half and half and things that, so they wouldn't have to run out to the grocery store to get, you know. So oh, we had wow. a, Yeah, we had a full menu of um, grocery items people can get. And then we throw in the occasional, you know, roll of toilet paper. If they <laughs> order. Um, yeah, that, that is if you could find toilet paper. Yeah, so, <laughs> but it, it's been an amazing, an amazing journey, an amazing ride here. And uh, you know, all, I'm proud of my franchisees. All, all three of them have done an excellent job in their communities. And it's just, it's just, uh, you know, when people hear Craigos, uh, you know, you, you always hear good things about it, which whether it's in my area or it's in Lakeway or it's in Onion Creek or it's in Balcones, you know, it's nice to see, it puts a smile on people's faces. So we're, yes. we're happy to be here. Yes, sir. And, and I believe you told me before when we spoke that you guys had raised over $100,000 uh, over the years uh, yeah. to put probably, back in the community. It's probably over 160, 170. I probably got to do more accounting. But, you know, it's just wonderful that, you know, we could give back to these schools and these organizations that, you know, my kids were a part of. Uh, now, you know, my kids are in college now, but, you know, now that my friends' kids are involved in and it's, it's just great to see that, you know, these kids now actually come work for us, 
you know, these kids were all babies when they, we opened or not even mm-hmm. born, now they're working for us. And one of the funniest stories I have right now is one of the restaurants where I grew up in uh, Levittown, New York, in a town called Wanta is the next one over. The owner and I know each other, our families know each other real well. And now his grandson is actually working for me uh, down here in Austin, Texas. So, I mean, it's just a small world, you know, and it's, uh, it's just funny how things like that happen. Yeah. And, and it's funny, you mentioned earlier, it's funny how things come back full circle. Um, you know, that support of the community really paid off when the, with the pandemic, with the community returning the favor at that point and making sure they supported, you know, your locations and your franchisees to, to keep the business rocking and rolling. And, and I'm sure there was still a lot of pain with the, the, uh, the pandemic in terms of, of business. Um, but it sounds like you overcame it pretty creatively. I've not heard yet of a, um, um, a business that's offered, you know, milk and bread and toilet paper along with the, the pizza, pizza and pasta. Well, we, we just reached out to our supplier and was like, what do you got? And, you know, since all the full service restaurants were shutting down at that time, cause they weren't allowed dine in, they had a excess of inventory. So we were yeah. like, and we were able to, you know, put it on our website and we just had a grocery page. And it was, it was pretty impressive to see people ordering a half a dozen eggs with a pizza and, <laughs> and a bottle of wine and a six pack of beer, you know? <laughs> that is, that's awesome though. It's incredible. I love it. It's a great, yeah. that's, that's a great story. I appreciate you sharing it. So 18 years in Austin, um, yes. You have bound to have uh, come across and, and, and been through all kinds of challenges, uh, notwithstanding the, the pandemic, but maybe prior to that. Um, when, you, when you started your first location, you know, were you thinking multiple locations, franchise at that point, or were you just trying to survive? I, I think it's the latter. You know, we were just trying to survive. Uh, you know, my wife and I still... I have a story when we're about three months in, four months in, and we're sitting in the back of our restaurant late at night, you know, with our family thinking we're not going to survive this. Um, you know, it was new to us. It was, I was always part of, part of a bigger operation, you know, a, fran- a franchise operation. Right. And, you know, to do it on your own, it wasn't, you know, it was just being in a new town. It was really tough. Um, but, you know, by the time that fifth month came around, we started seeing a rise in sales and uh, things started just flowing better and we we were doing more with our our outreach programs with the local schools and and all of a sudden you know with this big steep increase came and uh with you know within three to four months later we were looking for a second location oh wow uh, Mm -hmm. um so it really wasn't about expanding our actual first franchisee um happened to be a guest that just approached us and just loved the food and loved the atmosphere and they were just like hey you know we want to be a part of something like this um so we were never thinking about expanding more than one store at the time, or if we did, it was just for us, not, not to be a, a franchise operation. And, um, you know, but it, I'm happy to say that two of the three franchises are, were managers of mine. One was the first shift manager that I had. He's at Balcones in uh, Trent and his family. He ended up leaving us to go into banking. And then about a, about a year and a half, two years later, he called me back saying, hey, I'm coming back to Austin. I'd like to work for you again. I was like, great, we got an opening here. And uh, we were going to move that store eventually. And he was like, hey, what if I just buy it from you? And I was like, okay, great idea. So, you know, <laughs> you know, so now he's been running that store for about 12 years. Um, oh, wow. Same thing up in Lakeway. Andrew, uh, the owner up there, worked for me all through high school and college. I mean, through college, uh, ended up marrying his uh, college sweetheart who worked for Craig O's as well. And uh, she ended up having to go to uh, nursing school out in Midland. So he left for a while. And then when he came back, he was like, hey, I want to get back involved. And I was like, great. And uh, he worked for us again. And, uh, you know, eventually he ended up buying Lakeway from me. So Mm -hmm. it's, you know, we're a very tight family that way, you know. And my next manager, John, he's been working for me about 10 plus years now. And we're looking for a store for him. So, I mean, it's. You know, these are guys who've been in it day in and day out, know the ups and downs, know that there's a 100% chance, you know, today something's going to go wrong. Yeah. And know how to get through it, you know, and, uh, and have a real positive about what we do and really have a passion for what we do. Well, well I, I'm curious about how you, uh, and, and, and you come from, from CC's, and um, was CC's a franchise operation? Well, I work for the corporate side, but yes, okay. we were 
you had know, franchise and, and corporate owned. For every hundred stores, we had 10 that were company stores, say. So, I mean, out of, out of the 500, we had about 25 company stores. Um, so I got to work for Joe Croce, who was the owner. Um, we were a very linear company back then. It was Joe, my boss, and then, my, you know, then, then management underneath. So it wasn't layers and layers of HR back there. So we got to learn how to operate a business since day one, profit and loss, uh, you know, balance sheets, all this. He was an accountant. So he taught us right away how to run these businesses if they were going to pay 299 pizza. And um, so it was, it was, you know, I was young and a bunch of hungry young guys just, you know, working 80 hours a week, wanting to see a company grow and get better. And yeah. uh, it was fun to, fun to watch and learn and be a part of that. Well, in, in looking back at, I, mean, I think our audience, our listeners would, um, I'm sure there's a number of them out there who, who had that first location and, and maybe they've gotten to the point that it's stable and they're considering expansion. Um, Maybe we could lean on you for a little advice on, you know, what advice would you give someone who's looking for growth, whether to go company owned, franchise? Could, could you share a little bit about what your thoughts on that process? There's two parts to that, to that answer. I say, I'll say number one, especially in this climate right now that everyone's facing with, with employees, more is not always better. Um, you know, if they are, or have that one location and it's profitable and they're, you know, push it to do more. Uh, go out in that community and do more. I mean, if they have the type of food that's deliverable, expand your delivery area a little bit. Um, you know, what we're facing here in Austin in terms of uh, staff shortages is probably the, is the same actually wherever you go. You know, I, I get to travel a little bit and you know, whether it's Maine or New York or wherever you go, there's now hiring signs and it's really hard to compete with the government, uh, you know, for jobs. And, and if you are going to grow, Either way, you know, you're going to have headaches either way. So, you know, you got to decide if you want someone else to have the majority of the responsibility or do you want to have that for yourself? Um, and if you are going to grow, just make sure that it's people that know, know the business well. Uh, people who tend to want to get into the business just because they see an operation and don't really understand how it works or the amount of time and effort it takes. And those people, I think, are the reason why they say 90% of the restaurants fail within the first two years. Um, yeah. And so just, you know, be really smart about if you are going to grow franchise-wise, who you're franchising to. And then, you know, CC's had a great uh, program, and I actually uh, utilize it now when people say, hey, I want to open a store. I'll say, great, come work two days, open to close with me in the store. And uh, normally that's the first sign of, uh, I can't do that. I'm like, well, then... And we'll stop the conversation here till you can. Yeah. yeah. You know, because people don't realize, I mean, uh, you know, the effort that a, a lot of restaurant owners put into is the kitchen. And when you finally get it running the right way, it looks like you're not doing anything in that kitchen. Mm -hmm. and that's what people tend to see. You know, they see you out front being this, the mayor of your store or being the showman, right. but they don't realize that the only reason why you're able to do that is because that, you know, you've, you've spent almost 90% of your time, the first, you know, few years in that kitchen, getting it to run correctly. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a great point. So even if they come in and work with you for two days, they're still seeing something that's running smoothly. They're not seeing that, that startup piece. Right. Yeah. yeah. So for you to evaluate them, you know, the, you know, the biggest thing that CC's taught me at a young age was just, you know, Joe was very, persistent about attitude is everything. And that's kind of what I am with our manpower, whether it's the, the register person, the driver or the ship leader or the manager, it's gotta have a great attitude. If you can't, if you can't bring that minimum requirement to work, then you just can't work for Craigos. And no. Well, well, let me ask you this. Some, some of our people have, um, have asked me before uh, in the past and, and I've never really gotten a great answer for them. So um, when it comes to, when it comes to franchising, I mean, how much, how much work was it for you to, to develop the franchise itself? What, what was kind of involved there? And I know I, I didn't prep you for this and ask you this ahead of time, but. I think the biggest part is getting a really good franchise agreement. Um, we use yeah. the local company here in town and, and, you know, it's a pretty, what they call lock tight agreement, meaning I have all the rights and the franchisee has no rights. I think that's important. And then it, it's to follow through with that. And it really, you know, you got to follow the, the procedural law that's laid out there. 
But then it's just, you also got to spend time with that person, especially if they haven't been in the restaurant business. And you might be spending more time with that franchisee than you're spending in your own restaurant. So you got to be able to do that. You got to be able to free yourself up because, you know, their success is your best interest. You're, you know, making sure that they're whether following the recipes or, or, you know, following the, the systems that you're trying to, you know, that you're implementing in your own restaurants, you know, the whole point is to set them up for success. And, you know, a lot of what I found is spending a lot of time with these guys up front paid off, you know, on the back end. And, um, and then you got some that, you know, it's the old adage, you can lead the horse to water and you can't make them drink it, you know? Right. So as much as, uh, you know, the law ties our hands to some point because you don't want to look like you're operating that restaurant because that's when you get uh, in trouble, but right. you want to push or be able to, um, persuade the franchisee to say, Hey, you know, this is in your, the reason why I'm sharing this with you, it's in your best interest to do it. And, you know, eventually they come around to, it, you know, whether it's marketing, staffing, um, or whatever the solution, normally we haven't had issues when it comes to food quality. It really just comes to staffing the stores and then just following some marketing, some minimal marketing standards so that we can see their sales improve. Yeah. Yeah. I, I imagine that might be, one of the bigger challenges is to to ensure that they're invest continuing to invest on the marketing side and and the staffing side to maintain the quality number one and to get growth. No, it's exactly, and I try to really share that. Hey guys, let's not count pennies. I mean, you always you know I understand pennies are important, but it's it's to us you know our industry has always been the industry that hey can I get something donated? Can I get something this and. You know, people don't realize how much money they spend on marketing to go try to get a new guest. You know, and I try to, right. I try to persuade, you know, and my guys, the guys who work for me get it. Um, you know, they understand that if they give a pizza to a, a person who comes to them all the time, that they're going to share with a bunch of people that have never had us, it's a benefit. And it's, you know, besides the pizza cost, it costs us nothing. Right. And that's what people have a hard time understanding, that they're willing to spend hundreds or thousands of dollars to possibly go get a guest versus giving it to someone who's a fanatic that they're going to go share with five to 10 people that never had you. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, that's, what's, what's the better payoff? You know, no, no doubt. It's like a, that, that, that's the cheaper date right there. So <laughs> I understand it's hard for some people to wrap that, that thought around them, but it's like, to me, that's a no brainer, right? It's like, Hey, great. If you're going to go put this to people and then have us here, take five of them, enjoy it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that, well, that's a great way to look at it because it's it's like you said. There's only only the the food costs and the prep cost that you got into it, so it's very few dollars. Um, and and that makes me think about or kind of leads me. It, it jumps me ahead to another section. So I may I may go back and forth, but um, we talk about with a lot of owners. We talk about you know the performance metrics or the business metrics that that you really. Are, are trying to watch out there but with you guys what i mean what's important to you and your franchisees is term in terms of measuring the success of your business what what are you looking at are you looking at sales are you looking at margins are you looking at food costs you know as a percentage what, what are the most, more important metrics to be watching well at the end of the day right it's the old adage that sales solves everything right the more sales you have your labor costs go in line your food costs come in line um so we, yeah, I mean, we look at it. I mean, we've had, uh, during the pandemic last year, we had two stores that were double digit positive and we had two stores that were, uh, you know, 10% negative, um, which the two stores that were negative were in downtown areas more versus the, the two that were positive were in the outskirts where a lot of more restaurants had to close. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a good metric for us to see. Um, and then this year, all stores are double digit positive uh, over the pandemic and almost back to pre-COVID levels. Some are actually exceeding them. So sales is always a good uh, key key point to see, but you also got to watch some other costs, right? Labor costs. Obviously everyone now is, is seeing a tight labor market. We've seen probably anywhere from 10 to 15% increases in wages within the last three months to four months. Um, food costs, you know, I'll give you an example, wings, right? Wings went from yeah. eight a case to $160 in case. Oh my gosh. You got, you got companies like Pluckers, when you order five wings, it's 12 bucks and they're handing you a piece of paper saying, sorry for the high, you know, literally handing you a piece of paper saying, sorry for the high cost of wings, but we're putting a $2 surcharge. Um, 
So what we try to do is, you know, we try to to pivot mildly about every quarter, every four months, we'll do a, a price increase here and there. Uh, we try to really try to keep those prices low um, for our guests because we understand, you know, even though we're in Austin and it's a growing, uh, booming economy, we understand there's families out there that just uh, the the inflation, you know, their wages aren't growing with the inflation and we don't, you know, so so we get that. But back to your original question, I mean, sales to us is a real, is the big indicator. You know, we're, we're always trying to beat last year's numbers. And, you know, pre-pandemic, we were doing that year after year after year. Um, and so, uh, which I think makes it exciting for people to want to stay a part of what we're doing. Um, yeah. You know, the, especially for me with the franchise community, I mean, thankfully, you know, like I said, I celebrated 18 years. My other stores are all celebrating, you know, besides Lakeway 10 plus years, Lakeway will celebrate 10 years um, this year. Um, but it's really just uh, helping them understand that that growth's important because that just means we're expanding our, uh, you know, our presence in their market. And that's the important thing. It's really, um, you know, being able to get out there, whether it's the school carnival, whether it's the church event, whether it's uh, you're promoting the local baseball club during the summer, mm -hmm. just you know, finding new guests. And especially in the Austin market, you know, with us growing as fast as we're growing, uh, it's a it's a real good uh, litmus test for how we're operating. You know, we look at reviews. We look at uh, we're very you know uh, in step with how people review us. We'll we'll answer those reviews back. If you look at our website, um, people could leave reviews right on the site. Tell us how we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, we're very interactive with our our community about that as well. And, uh, you know, try to tell people it's pizza. I mean, we're not doing brain surgery and we're not, <laughs> uh, you know, nothing life threatening. So at the end of the day, guess you, guess at some point should be happy with what we're doing. If they're, you know, if we, if we have a mistake, we fix it. If, if you know, it's pizza. That's what we try to tell people. Yeah. Some, sometimes it's amazing how, uh, how customers can react. And, and, um, uh, I recall having said the same thing before in a, in a previous life, um, where, you know the you would get that you would get that aggressive response and you're like hey you know, it's okay yep. <laughs> it'll be all right well that's that, that is uh really interesting and, and i appreciate you sharing that because you know it's sales are always a big big indicator for for most of us and um you know some some business owners live in the metrics and that's all they want to look at especially on the franchise side because you know you you've got a you've got a monetary store and have some way to compare them and, and measure them against one another um but you know some of the more some of the independent shops who are you know one location uh stores may may manage more by feel you know they're watching the the plates as they come back to the kitchen and how much food's on them to determine if you know what they're doing and, and whether they're putting too much out um so it's it, it's a cross section, and, and I think finding a good mix seems to work well. And we're not afraid to ask our guests. I mean, I think if, if you've been in your community, you know, we'll put out feelers to our guests about certain product or certain, you know, we're, you know, what do you what about this? And we're not afraid to get the feedback. You know, yes, sir. Yeah. And, and that's a big point too. A lot of people don't want to know. And then the last thing we just started with our, our with our newest uh, software program that we implemented two years ago is just rewards. And so we have this program where folks, you know, when they order, get a point for dollar spent. And I think in the restaurant business, everyone's always hesitant to raise prices. But the more that you can put out some loyalty programs and stuff for your folks, you know, at the end of the day, I might raise my prices 10 or 15 percent every four months. But then it, that person sitting on, you know, 60 dollars in loyalty rewards that they could spend, say, eight, you know, re redeem eight bucks a time or five bucks a time. And, you know, we educate our kids to tell them, hey, do you want to use reward today? So all of a yeah. sudden that $50 bill goes down to 42 and they're like, great, thank you very much. They just saved almost, you know, 10%. Mm -hmm. I mean, so, you know, I think there's stuff that out there that you can do now with software that helps the businesses as well. And you don't have to pay an arm and a leg for it either. Um, you know, like our loyalty came with it, which was great. You know, uh, there's some out there that you have to spend a lot of money, but, you know, it's utilizing the tools that you have uh, within and getting yeah. that out to your guests constantly. And, and you mentioned it came with it. Was that part of the POS system? It is. It's part of the POS system. Okay. You know, look, when we were changing systems a few years back, we wanted something that was portable. You know, we do delivery 
Um, so we can actually swipe credit cards out the door if we want to. Yeah. To get that, we wanted something with loyalty. We wanted something um, <clears throat> with that we can interact with our guests. So we got email lists, text database lists that we can pull into and out of. Um, so I mean, just stuff like that. And then you know, we're busy on social media. I'm not. I don't love Facebook. I don't. You know, but but it's it's one of those things that will you know whatever we put out via email to our loyalty loyalty guests, we'll put that on Facebook as well and get shared. Mm -hmm. You know. Not saying it's a great response rate on Facebook, but I mean, at least we're out there and we're, yes, we're you know, um, and that's important. I mean, people want to know, you know, what do you have? What makes you different? Why should I come support you? And it's not always about the food. It could be about, you know, our crew or about what we're doing this week with the community or, you know, how, do, how can you get involved with Craigos, you know? So constantly sending messages almost daily to our community. And we're not afraid to tell our community, like, this is how we are, we interact with you. Well, that's, that, I think that's amazing advice. Um, you know, being, being familiar with, with the POS systems and, um, you know, being involved in that industry, which I am on, in my real job, um, it is amazing at how little that technology is utilized for many restaurants, you know, in many restaurants. Because um, as you said, there's a ton of tools in there that are available. The SMS and email marketing uh, are tremendous. And um, I think a lot of companies or businesses are missing the opportunity to capture those, um, those numbers, uh, that email address or those cell phone numbers, uh, right. and just hitting print, you know, and printing the receipt out and handing it to them. Right. Um, and, you know, that is, that is critical data for the business um, to be able to utilize that to get your return frequency up as, and, and customers communicated with and staying involved, which is part of the Crago culture is being involved in the community. So I think that's, that's amazing. Uh, you mentioned, and I just wanted to touch on, I don't know if, if any of us have a solution yet, but you know, staffing is um, uh, a critical problem in the industry. Um, how are, how are you guys approaching uh, recruiting and, uh, and trying to hang on to the people that you got and retention? You know, that, that's a great question. I think, you know, the biggest thing that we try to provide is a very, uh, you know, a really great work environment, first of all. I mean, I have, I was able to at least say for a long time, I still have one cook who's been with me since we opened. The last, I've I, actually about, for about a year ago, I had about four uh, and we lost them. Some went back to Mexico. We just lost some from attrition that started paying people $20 an hour. I mean, I, that's something that we just can't compete with. I think the biggest thing is just providing that consistent workplace. Um, you know, we don't, we don't, we're not overbearing to our guys. Um, we understand that we're going to get busy. Our managers and myself, I work daily. You know, we're not afraid to jump into the kitchen to assist. Um, I think what you need to do is uh, any business that we've always done, at least what CC's taught me early is that we cross train and cross utilize. So what we used to work three people uh, in the kitchen, now we work two and those guys will, you know, cook and, and then dish or clean or, you know, and they get paid for it, you know, versus, so, you know, it's easier and they're getting the hours they want and, yeah. you know, or they're getting the time off they want. So we're very uh, fortunate to have the crew we have um, and we take it that way and it's a blessing. And then we're also, um, we try to figure out new ways to utilize them and get things done. And if, uh, and then we, we all uh, actually, and this is like our next menu run is we take things off the menus, just, you know, if they're more prep, uh, heavy that we're just needing not the usage, we'll stop making it and it'll be become like a side or a secret menu item that if someone orders it, we can make it, but you know, we don't put that burden on the, the cooks anymore. Yeah. Uh, it's just you got to look at you know the great thing about pos that we just talked about is you know if i want to see what i've been going through in my last month or the last six months to see you know what's our top three items in this category what's our top three in this i can get that info and at the end of the day we can make make quick decisions on okay what are we going to keep and what are we going to get rid of going forward um but, you know, just creating that environment, you know, being able to walk in in the morning saying hello to your guys or you bring them a coffee or you bring them a taco or whatever it might be in the northeast is a, you know, egg sandwich out west that might be a, a breakfast taco. But it's just it's just treating them like family, you know, yeah. and sure that they're getting what they need. Wow. But like 
we are seeing definitely, you know, for the cooks, the front of the house staff, we really haven't had issues with those, you know, our drivers make 20 to 25 bucks an hour. And to be honest, we've actually just, you know, to help our drivers, we've actually cut back on drivers, not because we're less busy. We just said, hey, you know, let's, since we have the mapping systems and everything on the software, we don't need all these drivers, regardless of how busy we get, because it's just easy to map and get there. Yeah to their phone so now we have more experienced drivers who actually just instead of taking seven or eight deliveries they'll take 14 or 15 and they're happy um yeah. they're just small tweaks in the operation that way um you know the crew seems to respond well well that's that's awesome that, that, that was some good advice i, I love to cross train and cross utilize so I, I made a note of that i might i might borrow that terminology from you one day um, um and, and toss it out there, but that's that's relevant for any business, restaurants or or any other, especially when you've got staffing challenges um, yeah. like we have today. And, and I live it day and day and night. My wife's in the staffing business, yeah. um, and you know there, it, it's a whole other topic, and it's a political situation that you and I probably can't solve. So right. we'll we'll let it go with that. And um, and again, I'm I want to be very respectful of your time. Um, we've been on about 30 minutes and I would like, but I'd like to ask you a couple things about leadership and, uh, and then we can wrap up. Are you okay on time? That's okay. Fine. Okay. So, you know, leadership, I've got this section now called leadership lessons that, that we want to be able to share. And, uh, I guess my first question is how would you describe your leadership style and, you know, have you had to adapt it, you know, for this particular business? Yeah, I think that's great. I think, you know, uh, I, you know, some people, uh, I call it service leadership. You know, my job is to serve my guys. It's, it's basically, you've heard this paradigm before. It's an upside down pyramid, you know, and it's my guests, my crew, and then me. Um, you know, that's what we're here for. We're here to service the guests. So they're on the top of that pyramid. And then my crew serves them, and then I serve my crew. Um, and that's the way I look at it. I'm very humbled that we've been able to do this for 18 years and, and grow the way we have. And, you know, and I understand that every day that's a gift, um, you know, so when I go in, it's, you know, as much as I try to inspect and expect, I go in more of a, as a guest or more as a, hey, how can I help you when I go into the store? And then, you know, after, you know, an hour or two, then I walk around and, and try to see what we can do to be better and share that with the manager or get their advice. Hey, how do I make your life easier? What else need, do you need? You know, and he might say, hey, I need you to run to A Smart. And I say, great get me a list of things you need, you know, and it's not, Hey, I put that burden on them. It's, or, Hey, my cook, you know, we have a head cook who's been there 18 years and Hey, I need this, this, and this great within the, either that day or the next day he'll have it at his disposal. Um, so it, it's being able to respond and understand that I don't need to have the ego because I know I'm the boss. And at the end of the day, I make, I get to make the final decision. But it's really being able to go in there and, and, and serve these guys so that they can do the best job they can. And oh. that's, that's what we're trying to get out, right? I mean, we're trying to get the guests to have the best experience at the restaurant. So not only does my front of the house need to have a great attitude, my back of the house needs to have a great attitude about what they're doing, especially mm -hmm. if we're an open. If you walk into a Crego's, most of them, uh, you know, three out of the four stores, our kitchens are wide open. So if a cook's thrown is tongs or ladle at somebody i mean guess is it might they're, go they're gonna see it might go by the guest's head you know i mean so i mean it's <laughs> really trying to create that uh, that atmosphere and that environment that hey you know we're a team we're here for each other and no one is is above each other you know and there's a mutual respect in there well and, and I, I i applaud you for that because I, I think that approach you know one of one of my questions sometimes i ask is how are you developing you know the leaders within the business and you've already answered that because essentially you're you're enabling um, your managers and, and other leaders, you know, floor leaders to to develop themselves because your expectation is they're going to be able to tell you what's yep. needed. And yep. all you're doing is trying to help them, you know, get their job done. But it's on them to um, continue to develop themselves and their awareness and their their leadership abilities so that um, they can they can run the show. And uh, like you said, when you when you pop in, it's a matter of how can I help. Um, so I think that servant type of leadership is is uh, is really important. And um, sounds like a sounds like a great culture, a great environment. 
uh, at Craigos, and uh, I can imagine that um, I, I can see why your people are staying. Um, and you know, some of them ended up with a with a franchise. So exactly, yeah, it's that's fun. it's fun. Yeah, that, that that that's a great benefit. Well, do you have any? Um, you know, I, I guess I'm gonna take us toward the wrap up here because uh, again, I know you got you got things on your plate. Uh, no pun intended to get out. Um, any final advice, words of wisdom for achieving success for, um, you know, any budding or, or future entrepreneurs? You know, I, I think the, bi the biggest thing is, is obviously you got to wake up every day with a positive attitude going into work and knowing that, hey, you know, and, and that phrase I used earlier was actually taught to me by a buddy of mine that was my a CC's colleague. And, you know, we were having a bad day and whatever. <laughs> A lot of mistakes were happening at a, a store opening and he's like Craig you realize that there's a hundred percent chance that something's gonna go wrong today right and I just looked at him and that was that became our our big phrase you know and and when you approach approach the day with that mentality that means there'll be no surprises uh because in our business that's all it is it's surprise after surprise you know um and and just you got to persevere I mean at the end of the day my attitude has always been when I started Craigos is that the worst that can happen is I go back to work for somebody. Yeah. That was always my motivation to make Craigos a success. I didn't want to go back to work for somebody. So whether I had to make my food better or I had to figure out a better marketing plan or a better way to keep people, it was always, I want to be, you know, you know, Michael Jordan was always one of my favorite athletes. And I always, that's one of the things I've always told people, if I'm going to do whatever job it was, whether I was with CC's or whether with Craigos, which I was fortunate to only have the two so far. And I said, you know, we could be the Michael Jordans of pizza. And, you know, that's my goal every day. We can, not that I have the best pizza in Austin. I'm not going to get into that subjective, you know, world, but it's, Hey, we can have the best operation. We can, you know, we can, mm -hmm. We can have consistently good food and we can have a great work environment. And that's what I try to pound into our guys daily. You know, let's be the Michael Jordans of this world here, at least in our four walls. And, you know, it kind of makes us challenge ourselves daily. You know, let's make it cleaner. Let's make, how do we make it better? And just keep moving us forward, which, you know, fortunately for us, it has moved us forward with that mentality. Yeah, well, it sounds like it. And, and for those of you in our audience and, and uh, there in Austin, Texas, Austin Lakeway and that whole, that whole area, again, uh, Craig Oates is, is there. They've got the four locations, Southwest, uh, Balcone, Sunion Creek, and Lakeway. Right. Um, and if you haven't been there, get there and, and enjoy some time with, uh, with Craig and his team. Um, Great meals, great experience, and uh, we appreciate you, Craig, being on here to, on here today and sharing your thoughts and advice and and experience because you know that's what it's all about when it's said and done is you've lived it um, and you've learned the hard way probably more the often than not of what not to do and uh, uh, we hope that our, our audience members can can grab some of those uh, nuggets of advice and put them to work. So thank again, you. thank you for your time today, sir. We appreciate you being on. Thank you. Same as well. Thank you so much. Yes, sir, Craig. And to all our, our listeners, thanks for tuning in today to the Local Leaders Podcast. Uh, I'm Jeff Johnson, your host, and uh, we'll be talking to you again soon. Thank you.